Hello everyone, I'm Mark Hayes with the Arkansas Municipal League. It's a pleasure to join you once again on what we now affectionately refer to as the combination call. Uh, that includes municipal officials, our friends from ACHI, we have police chiefs, fire chiefs, local state chambers, and the state chamber itself. Uh, very happy to have the business community and the and municipal leaders gathered together for this informational session on the virus. I want to thank, as always, the ACHI group. What a great team it is. Joe, thank you for all the work you do, and Sandra behind the scenes as well. Greatly appreciate what ACHI does on a daily basis. And to Waymac and crew, uh, couldn't do this without y'all. It's a great setup, and we really appreciate it. Uh, we've got a, actually a, a kind of a neat little show set up for today, and we have a special guest, uh, a friend of both mine and uh, Dr. Thompson's, Jim Keat. And Jim is a longtime uh, business person in Little Rock, uh, a restaurateur uh, to Zeke's, Petit and Keat, and the Cypress Social Club. I'm happy to say that I have uh, dined at all of them uh, routinely, and they are fantastic. Uh, we, we also uh, get a little benefit from uh, Mr. Keats' uh, service with the Arkansas legislature as both a representative and a senator. Thank you, uh, Jim, for joining us. I'm excited to hear what you have to say. We'll uh, ask you a few questions shortly. Uh, in addition to the League's COVID resource page, please make sure that you take a look at our social media pages. Uh, we really try to keep that updated as well as possible. Uh, the, uh, the COVID resource page is at the top of the league's homepage. All you have to do is click on the banner. Uh, we'll go about an hour today, uh, roughly speaking, depending on questions and uh, what we may uh, get into discussion-wise. Uh, Dr. Thompson, as always, is going to give us a, a most recent update statistically and uh, medically on where we are and, uh, and logically, as we sometimes talk about. Use the Zoom chat feature to get any of your questions in and mute your devices, otherwise it's a very unpleasant experience for everyone. And with that, I know you have a lot to cover today, uh, Dr. Thompson, so I'm going to kick it to you for your presentation. Great. Thank you, Mark, and thanks everyone for joining us on this April Fool's Day. I'll start off by promising no jokes, at least for the first 59 minutes. Uh, I may have something for you at the end, uh, just to keep you on your toes. Uh, let's jump in. We've got a lot going on, a lot of movement, a lot of changes, a lot of new developments. Uh, in the United States, we now have had you know, 30 million confirmed cases. Unfortunately, we continue to uh, count the deaths moving forward. We are not through this yet, although we have made you know, great headway in this forest fire that we have been fighting over the past year. Uh, you'll see the drop in cases uh, uh, on the next slide uh, from where we peaked you know, after the Thanksgiving, the holiday, then the New Year spikes. I do want to draw your attention. We dropped down. We were pretty flat in March. You see an uptick here at the end of March. Um, uh, there has been a 16% increase in new cases, a 6% increase in new deaths over the last week. So we are not out from under the forest fire threat yet that we have going forward. Luckily here in Arkansas, those increases we have not yet experienced, but this is a heat map of new cases and spread over the last two weeks. And you can see the upper Midwest, the East Coast, uh, uh, in the uh, Southeast uh, part of Texas, Southwest part of Louisiana. Uh, these are new cases uh, that are out of control and we are not out from under the efforts yet. Uh, last week was spring break. This is, next one is a picture of uh, Miami. Um, we, as you'll remember from our Thanksgiving holiday and New Year's spikes, the spikes occur about 10 days to two weeks after congregated events come together. So I think the next two weeks are really a, a concern as we watch nationwide for the impact of spring break. The United States has come down, the, the high peak there, uh, we are down. Uh, Brazil and now India are competing with the United States for the most number of new cases over the last seven days. In Arkansas, we are benefiting from the efforts that we have put in place through the defensive measures of mask wearing, distance, and hygiene, and the increasing uptake of vaccinations. Uh, uh, we're now below 200 hospitalized and below 30 for the first time in a long time on ventilators. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, we are still marking a number of new deaths. Um, and the new cases, as I show on the next slide, 
Uh, you know, we are in a good situation now in the state. We must hold the line though. This is not an all clear signal. The tornado clouds, uh, this is not a tornado siren where the clouds, when they move to the east, it's over. This is now a continued threat. Our hospitals are continuing to do well. We've seen a reduction in the number of hospitalizations that continues to be, you know, you'll remember a year ago, our biggest threat was that we were gonna overtop the capacity of our hospitals. Uh, through science and medical advances, we're learning better how to treat people. We're having you know, more medic medical therapies available. If you do get COVID and if you are symptomatic, I strongly encourage you to reach out to your local hospital so that you can get the IV um, immunoglobulin therapy to prevent some of the severe outcomes that we are still witnessing and some of the long-term effects. On hospitalizations and deaths, uh, we continue to have a number of hospitalizations and deaths, as I mentioned. It is in the under 65-year-old population now uh, and as being reported nationwide. It is the, the 21 to 65-year-olds that are being most affected, largely because we have vaccinated the older populations and the threat from COVID is still present among our communities. This is a slide I wanna draw people's attention to. While our hospitalizations are down, we continue to lose 10 to 12 Arkansans on a daily basis due to COVID. Uh, these are members of our community, our families, uh, you know, our, our, our co-workers. Uh, so the threat is still there. Uh, it is going to be with us for the coming months. So we must not let up now. In 2020, COVID-19 became the third leading cause of death behind heart disease and cancer. So this, this has had a huge impact uh, on our state and, and throughout our nation. We continue to learn, and, and this is a cause of concern that I don't have new knowledge to bring you today, but we will keep on our uh, radar screens or the long-term effects. As many as 30% of people uh, that were infected with COVID-19 from mild infections to more severe infections are now having long-term organ damage, primarily affecting the heart, the lung, a brain fog that people are reporting. We are seeing people uh, weeks after their infections having blood clots with with uh, clots then causing damage in other uh, organ systems. Uh, I wanna just draw your card. While we are making progress, there is a wild card in our environment. We have two of the types of covariants present in the state of Arkansas. These are both more infectious and one potentially more lethal. Uh, the variants of concern that are in the nation are listed here now. Uh, and, and I think these, this is the wild card. Uh, we need to get people vaccinated so the vaccines that still appear to be effective against these variants can uh, quell the transmission. If we lose control of one of these variants in our vaccines, then we, ha we have the possibility of having to regress in some of the openings that we've had. On the vaccine front, uh, continued good news. Uh, the vaccine tracker moving forward, I think we don't have new vaccines approved, but we are expanding the number of vaccines that, or the age ranges of vaccines. Uh, Pfizer reported earlier this week some promising numbers uh, that their vaccine is both safe and effective down to 12 years of age. Uh, they also have uh, a test going on for infants and children that will take a longer period of time because the safety uh, component there uh, is, is more rigorous. Uh, for our progress in the state of Arkansas, we are making progress on, on the left here in the, the teal. These are the percentage of individuals over age 16 fully immunized. We, we're around 13 to 15 percent of the state that's fully immunized. Uh, in the middle, in the blue, these are those that are partially immunized. You put those together, we now have somewhere between 25 and 30 percent of eligible Arkansans over age 16 that have some protection from the vaccine. This is very, very promising. And again, I think if we can wait and hold on to the next two months as vaccines become more available, it will be a critically important achievement. On our vaccine progress, we've received 1.7 million doses. We've administered about a million. That's a 57% range. Some of those are being held back for second doses. Uh, the federal program has caught up from its relatively uh, slow initiation. Again, the supply line is opening up. The governor's and Secretary Romero's announcement earlier this week that all individuals now over the age of 16 are eligible is very, very good news. And I encourage individuals of all ages over age 16 to now seek out and get that vaccine as quickly as possible. We continue to have good news on the effectiveness of the vaccines. 
It's a technical term. Efficacy is when you're in a clinical trial and, and people are watching everything. Effectiveness is what happens in the real world as you launch it and you're not paying you know, as, as close an attention. But we, we continue to see the uh, uh, Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines having 90% effectiveness in the real world. Uh, so this is really critically uh, uh, beneficial. Uh, and nearly 4,000 healthcare workers, first responders, uh, were tested uh, for that in the, in the first uh, outlays of the vaccines, and we know. Uh, we mentioned this last week, the CDC has changed its guidance, loosened it, if you will, for fully vaccinated people, fully vaccinated defined as two weeks after the second dose of a Pfizer or Moderna vaccine, or two weeks after the single dose of the Johnson & Johnson vaccines. Uh, we call this the grandfather clause that fully vaccinated individuals can gather indoors with other fully vaccinated people uh, in small groups or in a family that has no risks with unvaccinated people so that grandparents can now visit uh, their families uh, and, and see their grandchildren in a safe way if they are fully vaccinated and it's been two weeks since their last vaccine. Also importantly, if you're fully vaccinated and you're exposed, you no longer have to be quarantined or tested. But what has not changed is if you are fully vaccinated and you're in a public space where there are other large numbers of unvaccinated individuals, you still need to wear a mask. We still need to maintain our six feet of distance and a strong message to avoid crowds, particularly indoors where ventilation is a larger threat. Uh, the CDC is uh, asking folks to continue to, del to delay um, uh, domestic and international travel where possible and all of us need to continue to watch for COVID-19 symptoms. The 90% effectiveness still means that 10% of us could become infected even after vaccinated. Uh, so far, the vaccines are holding that it prevents severe illness, hospitalizations, and death, but you can become infected even if you've been vaccinated and be a spreader, uh, potentially. Now here's as close as I'm gonna to get to a, a April Fool's joke here in our presentation. We do have individuals that are uptaking the vaccine, but unfortunately we have a number of individuals that don't yet understand the importance of the vaccinations, uh, the, those that are, are resisting. So even if you've been fully vaccinated, you still need to start to think about how am I gonna manage my risk? So what you can do once fully vaccinated, these are some of the questions that you need to ask yourself as you entertain going out again and, and reducing some of your um, uh, protections. You know, what are you doing? Is it indoors? If so, is there good ventilation? Will you be there for a long period of time? The CDC guidance is 15 minutes for um, an exposure. We've opened it up here for an hour, you know, but if you can not be indoors for more than an hour, that reduces your risk. Will there be high intensity shouting, for example, at a basketball game or singing at a church event? All of those things we know because of logic are going to increase the likelihood for a transmission of COVID-19. Who will you be with? Is it gonna be a crowd of more than 10 people? Will you be around people that you're not usually around or that you don't know? Is everyone vaccinated? Are the, everybody following health guidelines so that you're working together to minimize each other's risk? Who's in the circle? Are there kids there that have been going to school? Are there any adults that are not vaccinated? Or importantly, are there any high-risk individuals that are immunocompromised that could have a bad outcome? Uh, where do you live? Uh, you know, if you were in one of those hot spots, I would encourage you to stay indoors and, and not be going out in, on the East Coast or in the upper Midwest. Right now in Arkansas, we are not having that because we have been successful with the efforts we've been put in place. And then finally, what, what, are the, what is your health situation? Do you have underlying risks? If you get sick, can you afford to stop working and isolate? You know, will you have access uh, to sick leave and other issues you know, if you do get sick? All of these are about risk mitigation. The risk is no less on April 1st than it was on March 31st. We are changing some of our directives at the state level, but the COVID virus is still in our communities and is still looking to take advantage of individuals when their guards down. So I, I think these questions uh, uh, we'll put up on our website uh, and in our presentation here, but I think they're important going forward. Now back to this virus, which we have shown you the spikes of now for uh, over a year. Um, we are moving out of a pandemic emergency. We've never done that before. So each step that we take is unknown, uncharted, and is full of risks. Some that we know, some that we don't know. So earlier this week when the governor uh, 
uh, lifted the mask mandate, that was a lifting of state action. That does not mean that leaders and individuals don't still have to take action. Right now, these are the United States on restrictions and mask mandates on the businesses. Most businesses are now open with minimal restrictions. On the mask mandates uh, nationwide, it is a, a split version here on, on the mask mandates. Uh, with the lifting of the state restrictions, my board this morning took a strong um, call to action uh, for community leaders, for school board uh, members, uh, for faith leaders, uh, uh, for elected local officials to actually maintain the mask mandates and the other efforts. None of these guidances have changed. Face coverings are still recommended by the CDC. Business and restaurant operations are still recommended to have distance and not be at 100%. Casinos, barbershops, gyms, the indoor and outdoor venues, the elective medical procedures, all of the guidance that the CDC and the state had in place last week, the guidance is still there this week. The only thing has changed is you cannot be fined by the state of Arkansas or penalized for not following the guidance. So it is now up to local leadership and individuals to put that guidance into place. I mentioned our board call this morning. It really does call on members that are on this call as well as others across the state, business owners, school board members, as I mentioned, faith leaders and local elected officials to now locally adopt the strategies and maintain the Department of Health and CDC guidelines to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. And very specifically, the termination of the state mask mandate should be replaced by local decisions to continue the important efforts to minimize the spread of this illness. The call, as I mentioned, continue the mask, maintain the signage, keep spaces ventilated, encourage and educate employees about the importance of being vaccinated. For individuals to now get vaccinated across all age ranges 16 and up and encourage others to do the same, to continue wearing a mask in public, maintain the hygiene that we've had successfully prevent the spread, maintain a distance and avoid crowds. I'll close on this because I think it's important. We've talked now for a year about the combination of science, new science, for this new threat of the virus that is coming forth. We continue to have new science, but logic is equally powerful and important to pair with that science. And now the action step that up till this week has been largely statewide and nationwide. That action step has now been transferred to local leadership, business leaders, elected leaders, faith leaders, and so forth. And I think if we can just hold on another 60 to 90 days and break the back of this virus, then Mark, on the first day of opening season for baseball, I can show you where I hope to be in the month of July in St. Louis with my Cardinals back to normal in a post-pandemic world. So thank you for this. Uh, let's, let's stay adhered to it. I look forward to uh, hearing Mr. Keat and his perspective as a, as a restaurateur and a business owner. Uh, we are not out of the woods. It is not an all clear signal, but we are making progress and we need everyone to lean in and continue to do the right thing so that we can break the transmission cycle of this virus. Thank you. Uh, as always, highly informative, a little bit frightening. We got to stick with the uh, stick with what we know works and, and when in doubt, listen to Dr. Fauci uh, and uh, take the CDC advice. I do want to mention one thing uh, before uh, we go to uh, Mr. Keat. Uh, you mentioned that we're now at uh, anybody 16 and older can get the vaccine. Uh, let's, let's redirect this conversation one more time to remind everybody, whichever vaccine is available to you, that's the one you need to get. You do not need to pick and choose and wait. That's correct. We still have you know, the, the challenges of the Pfizer vaccine that come in a tray of almost a thousand doses and once thawed, it has a limited period of time. So that's going to be mostly at your large institutions, your hospitals, large manufacturing sites, others. Uh, the Moderna vaccine is in a 10 dose vial, so it actually can, once thawed, be used in smaller group settings. And the Johnson & Johnson um, uh, vaccine is in a single dose vial. So if you're in a rural part of the state, it's more likely you're going to get the Johnson & Johnson single dose option. If you're in a more urban, large institution, it's more likely you're going to get the Pfizer. The health department is routing these vaccines so that we can get optimal spread of vaccine availability around the state. Take the one that comes to you first so that you get the protection you need the fastest. Thank you. Uh, and now let's talk with our friend uh, Jim Keat. 
Uh, Jim, I want to thank you for joining us again. Uh, very helpful, uh, as always, to have a member of the business community here, particularly uh, with the audience that we have. We have community leaders, both from business and uh, from City Hall. Uh, I think of that as the perfect economic marriage to ensure that uh, business goes forward in a, a safe and productive uh, manner. Uh, we just went over the fact that the governor uh, lifted the mask mandate, uh, but some businesses like yours have continued to require masks. I'd like you to tell the audience sort of how you came to that decision uh, and why you're continuing to do what you're doing. Uh, Mark, thank you. And first of all, Joe, it's uh, good to know that you're a Cardinal fan. I'm from Springfield, Missouri, so I'm still a Cardinal fan, so I'm glad to hear that. Um, one, uh, just a brief clarification, we are continuing the mandate with regard to our staffs. Uh, we have a, a new uh, sign that goes up, uh, you can't read that, that, that has gone up for our guests. And it lets them know that for their safety and the safety of uh, our staff, we are continuing to require uh, masks for all of our employees, about 300 in the state of Arkansas. We are encouraging all of our guests to wear a mask. And part of the verbiage in there, I think is important to kid, because what we had said is that we encourage our guests to wear masks until they are seated out of respect for other patrons, which is consistent with the existing uh, or the former mandate. Uh, we are also letting them know that we have masks available at our sanitation stations. In addition to the masks, we also have hand sanitizer, uh, and encourage everybody to make sure that they are uh, availing themselves of those. Um, in addition, we have implemented a very aggressive vaccination program that's led by my son, Jake. Uh, we now have vaccinated well over half of our staff. We're, we're approaching 70%, in fact. Uh, almost uh, 200 people have been uh, vaccinated, over 300 folks in the state of Arkansas. And that goes uh, for uh, other companies that aren't even in the hospitality industry that we're involved in. Um, we also uh, have taken steps to let our uh, patrons know how much we appreciate their cooperation and to respect other people. Uh, we're continuing many of the other things that used to be a mandate that are now the CDC recommendations in terms of frequent hand washing. Uh, we have not gone to 100% capacity in our restaurants. Uh, we continue to try to maintain uh, the six feet social distancing. And so we're, we're in effect doing everything except uh, requiring our guests, requiring our guests uh, to uh, wear masks. We're very much encouraging it and uh, hoping that people will be respectful of other patrons in the restaurant and our staff to do so. Um, from day one, we have in our restaurants, and I've been doing this for a while, uh, since I was 15. And so uh, our restaurants, we have always taken great pride in just how uh, clean our restaurants are, the uh, sanitation standards that we require, the protocols that we had in place long before uh, COVID came around. And we have doubled down our efforts to make sure that we have a safe environment that has included uh, doing some things to our HVA systems in some of the stores, putting a bio zone uh, in all of our stores, which helps um, at, at least one, in some cases, as many as four uh, bio zones, which uh, kills the uh, virus upon contact. Uh, so we've taken a lot of steps and will continue to do so to uh, keep our staff safe as well as our patrons. Uh, I mentioned this the other day when I was testifying at the at the uh, at the uh, started to say literacy council. I was on that for for quite some time at the legislative council, uh, and that is that we consider our staff to be heroes. We have um, we haven't made it mandatory for people to come to work. Uh, we work with them in every way possible, but uh, there have been a lot of different approaches on how to work our way through. Uh, this crisis, and we've done our very best to both continue to uh, keep our staff employed as well as take those precautions to keep them safe. And so we're very proud of the efforts that we've made as a company. Uh, and those who have stayed open 
uh, we consider to be real heroes. It's, it's not like the frontline uh, workers in healthcare, uh, the doctors and nurses and janitors and everybody else in the hospitals, but I can assure you that uh, our staffs have taken, taken this virus very seriously. They have been very, very consistent about wearing masks and uh, taking all the other appropriate measures to uh, keep our restaurants safe. Thank you very much. I, I think we'd all be uh, curious. Uh, it's hard to believe, frankly, that it's been a year since we've uh, been in this pandemic. Uh, and as we begin to navigate our way out of it, for, let's talk about, from your perspective, what's been the most challenging part of this over the last 12 months? I think probably uh, just working with our guests to make sure that they understand why we're being so restrictive on the protocols is quite interesting. And I, I mentioned this the other day, you're kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. We know that we're going to be facing that going forward because uh, some of our guests are very adamant about everyone who enters wearing masks and others are very resistant to wearing masks at all. And, and sometimes that causes some confrontations with our staffs when we have asked uh, our patrons to put a mask on if they didn't have one on, you know, that kind of thing has occurred in, uh, in virtually every restaurant. So it's just been a very challenging time for our staff to balance not only their own health care, but uh, to try to keep uh, our guests happy uh, in, in a safe environment. That's been the most challenging part. I, I, well, lots of surprises for all of us over the last year. Uh, from a positive and a negative standpoint, what, what uh, surprises have popped up in your world? Oh, I think it's, it's probably the appreciation of our guests for uh, all the measures that we have taken. Uh, I work a lot in the restaurants at night at uh, Petit and Keith and Cypress Social and uh, during the day in the Tzatziki's, but um, mostly at night in the other restaurants. And you would be surprised how many, how many people have taken the time to not only thank our staff, but to thank me personally for being open. Uh, I've had so many people of all ages saying that this is our first time out in a year. And we're so grateful that, uh, that, you're, that you're open. I've heard uh, younger families say, this is the first time that we've been away from our children in a year. Thank God for you. <laughs> you know, those kind of comments. So. Uh, we've just done our best to navigate this being very responsible, uh, but also responsive to our guests. One of the things that we've done is that we think will, in the long term, frankly, will help our business model as we've been more aggressive about a delivery model, uh, curbside service. Uh, our fast casual restaurants have been able to utilize the drive throughs effectively. And so what's really been challenging uh, for us, Mark, that uh, the day that uh, the day before the uh, crisis occurred formally, uh, we were up versus the prior year versus 2019 in 14 of the 15 restaurants that we have in this area. Um, the next day, we were either down 70% or closed in one day. And so you can imagine the disruption that that caused and how to uh, try to keep our staffs employed and uh, to keep them going and to still not go bankrupt in the process. This was before the PPP had yet been envisioned, that kind of thing. So it's been the most challenging year in my time in the restaurant industry, but I couldn't be prouder of our staffs. And we really believe that because of some of the things that we have learned during this crisis, we will ultimately be stronger than ever. Uh, unfortunately, the statistics show that about uh, 25 to 30 percent of all the restaurants in the country will be closed and won't reopen. And uh, thank God we are among those that will still remain open. And as I said, we hope to be stronger going forward. Thank you. I, I think you had a chance to testify uh, on Monday at ALC, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, would you tell us a little bit about your support for the Public Health Authority and and kind of why you were there? Well, there were a couple of things. Uh, I think the governor has done a magnificent job of navigating through this and trying to balance all the various concerns uh, involved. And uh, one of the things that I was there for was, I was kind of hoping that 
the uh, mask mandate might be extended for a time. The primary reason for that was so that more people could get mask vaccinated. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've been very aggressive about uh, requiring uh, our staffs to wear masks and all of those kind of things, and also a very aggressive program to uh, be sure that our staff is vaccinated. Uh, my youngest son, Jake, has done a fantastic job on that, of making sure that um, we're kind of the leader in that regard. And so we've not only helped vaccinate our staffs, but uh, have helped other restaurants uh, gain access uh, after 1C was uh, enabled. So uh, just really proud of the job that we've done. And uh, we were kind of hoping that the mask mandate might be extended for a time. Uh, we also thought there might be implications for the employer retention tax credits that um, are very important for our business. Uh, we think that that, not by itself, but as another arrow in the quiver would help us uh, with regard to accessing those funds down the road. We don't know whether we're going to be eligible or not because it's a, a very strict criteria. We we're hoping that that uh, one extra step would help us in securing those uh, tax credits going forward. And one of the things that uh, in our society now is the instant communication of text messages and through the chat feature. Uh, we do have a question specifically for you. Uh, the question is, I wasn't clear on the bio zones that Mr. Keat mentioned. Um, I, I don't know if you can clear that up. Yeah, sure. Um, Biozone is actually a brand name for um, a, it's an electronic machine that you put into the restaurants. Uh, they're supposed to kill the, the bacteria for about a 3,000 square foot restaurant. Uh, we've put multiple units in ours. Uh, as an example, at Cypress, I think we have I think we have five biozone units and we also modified our HVAC systems both there and at Petit and Keat uh, because they're larger restaurants. Uh, we also have outdoor areas and open areas, patios and that kind of thing. And so that helps us with uh, people feeling safer uh, outside now that the weather is getting nicer. But uh, those are very effective units um, and it's just it's spelled B-I-O-Z-O-N-E, uh, biozone. Thank you. Uh, it's date night tonight for uh, myself and my wife. You got a suggestion on where we should go to dinner? I think you should have appetizers at Petit and Keat and then go to Cypress Social overlooking the lake and the fountain uh, and the trees uh, on the other side of the lake that we have lit up. Thank you so much for joining us. Very helpful and it's nice because we have this combined audience of uh, municipal leaders and business leaders across the state. So we appreciate your leadership uh, and your sort of cutting edge thinking on this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim, for you and your team. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. Mark, if I could pick up on something that Mr. Keep said, and, and I think we are increasingly aware and have an opportunity. Ventilation is important. I mean, the virus gets diluted if it's present, if you're outdoors, if you have the opportunity to eat at one of the outdoor venues. You know, again, I think this is logic. This is about using what we know about this virus. Uh, I, was, I was listening to Mr. Keaton. I was thinking, you know, 15 months ago, most Americans, most Arkansans didn't think very much about viruses. But we now have had 12 months of an intense education learning opportunity and I think now is the time for us to be thinking both from a business perspective of, of how you run your business from uh, physical improvements and ventilation, other efforts. Uh, this threat is going to be with us for a while. Uh, I think it is likely to have some resurgence next fall as we come back inside. Let's learn and lock down what we have learned and use it to be prepared so that we don't experience what we have had over the last year. Well, as usual, we have some uh, very good questions for you. Uh, and so let's get right to them. Are you happy with the pace that we're getting vaccines out and shots in arms? I am, I am pleased with the increase in the supply line, which then has allowed the governor to open up the supply to all individuals 16 and over. I am concerned because part of that opening up is because of the demand. The people who have been getting the shots has not remained as high as I had hoped. 
So while I think we're doing a good job, we must continue to strive to educate, to engage, to have people encourage uh, all individuals to get vaccines. You know, I've got friends, I've got family that have some hesitancy. I've said on this show before, the 60 seconds before I got my vaccine, I had a little apprehension until I thought about, okay, what do I know about COVID-19? What do I see happening to individuals who have gotten COVID-19? And what are we learning about the long haulers that may be lasting effects from COVID-19? And that apprehension dissipated very quickly. And I think most folks, after they get the vaccine, have a sense of relief that they now have protection or will soon have protection against something that we have been fearful of for the last 12 months. Uh, we've got actually sort of a couple of questions here that, are, that mesh. Uh, so I'm gonna ask this one first and see if I can weave the other one in. Uh, if you're fully vaccinated and really wanna see family members in another state, is it safe to fly if you wear a mask, socially distance, wash your hands, I'll add, make sure you wipe down the seat and the planes, t the fold down table, et cetera. But that, that's the question. I'll, I'm, um, I'll, I'll ask you the other one that's sure. related here in just a second. So that's why I included those questions about your own personal risk tolerance and your own personal risk assessment. We are coming out from under a pandemic that has largely restricted us from doing most things that we normally do. And as we come out from that pandemic, each new step is an unknown step and not a risk-free step. So when I'm asked, is it safe to fly? I have to ask, are you saying, is there any chance that I will get COVID-19? Because if you fly, the answer to that is yes. Are there things you can do to minimize the chance of you getting COVID-19? The answer to that is yes. The things you just said, if there's a way to take a direct flight as opposed to go through a large hub where there are tens of thousands of people inside of a closed space with maybe not that good of ventilation, um, I think a direct flight is better. Uh, I think probably flying, as we've talked about in grocery stores before, flying earlier in the day rather than later in the day where you have the benefits of the cleaning that went on overnight, that is probably a logical strategy. I have no science to say that, but it's logic. Use your logic to say, how do I minimize my risk? And use your logic to say, what are my risks? If I'm an individual with one of the uh, high risk issues, COPD, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, I would strive to, to find a way that you don't have to take extra risk in, in going through the airports. I wanna come back to the 90% the effectiveness, which means it's 10% not effective. All these vaccines are showing to be almost 100% effective once you get the vaccine and you've had a two week period to prevent hospitalizations, bad uh, ICU admissions and death. So it's 100% effective for those bad outcomes. The 10% are, is the potential that once vaccinated, you could become infected, not sick, but infected and be a carrier somewhere to another population. So that's why, again, using your logic, as you go to visit family, are those family members vaccinated? Are any of them at high risk? Are any of them potentially gonna have a bad outcome should they come in contact? If you are unfortunately a carrier now, not sick, not symptomatic, fully vaccinated, but in the 10% of folks that could be a carrier of this virus. That's why I come back. If we can hold the line in the next two months to three months, the next 60 to 90 days, get people vaccinated, then the chance that you're gonna come in contact with somebody who has the virus goes way down. And we really get close to that herd immunity goal where we can breathe easier, we can get back to a new normal lifestyle, and you and I can be at the Cardinals game in July. That'd be great. Um, so here's the related question, and I, we, I think in a sense you've probably answered it, but let's make sure. So I'm gonna put it in the form of an example because I think it's easier that way. Uh, I'm vaccinated, I'm past my two weeks. You're vaccinated, you're past your two weeks. When is it safe for us to get together uh, without masks? The CDC guidance now says that if you are fully vaccinated and you're in a small group and you're in a well-ventilated space, that you can come together now without masks. I would say that's a group of less than 10 people. 
uh, ideally probably less than five, but your poker game, my mom's bridge game, those things for fully vaccinated individuals can now start to resume. I would, again, and we've said this before, the first card down needs to be your vaccine card so you make sure that everybody is fully vaccinated and then people can relax a little bit in that small group in a situation that is safe now because of the vaccinations. Uh, it's still then when you leave and you go back out into a larger group, you go into being with individuals that you do not know if they are fully vaccinated, that's a time to mask up and put your defenses back up at your highest level. So in regard to this discussion, um, are there studies proving that people can still be a carrier after the vaccination? There are studies showing that individuals can still be a carrier, that they have had positive you know, uh, uh, tests, cultures uh, after. We will learn more over time. And also we will learn, you'll remember, one of the questions we still don't know the full answer to is how long the protection from the vaccine lasts. So if we get into a situation, hopefully a year or more from now, where we start to see more people becoming carriers or potentially vaccinated individuals starting to have illness again, and there are studies going on to look at this, we'll know that we need to think about a booster strategy or something about having a, a, a new vaccine come along to give us that protection. We're not there now. The vaccines are, are fully effective against having bad outcomes. It's just a small likelihood that you could be a carrier once vaccinated that we still need to maintain our, our, our defenses. Once we get enough people vaccinated, that 10% is going to go away because you won't come in contact with somebody who is infected. And that's where the herd immunity kicks in and then we can all truly relax and get to the new normal that we're so anxious to get to quickly. Now the CDC director uh, almost broke down in tears uh, the other night and uh, over the potential for another surge. Uh, we've removed our mask mandate in this state and so opening and I think sort of implicit in that is opening up for business. Are you concerned about another surge in Arkansas? I am concerned about the wild card of the variants. And we have two of the variants known to be in Arkansas now. Both appear to be more infectious, one of which appears to potentially be more lethal. So though that, those wild cards are my concern. If they start spreading quickly, we could lose the advantage that we've had in place. Now the governor lifted the mask mandate, and, and as you said, Jim was at Legislative Council on Monday. Uh, for your viewership, uh, I watched the Legislative Council meeting, and they actually had a motion to immediately end the public health emergency, and about a third of the legislators did voted for that. So what I think the strong signal is, is it's now time for local leadership to step into the action space. Uh, our state government has, has pulled back from protective efforts, I think potentially somewhat prematurely because of the wild card threat. Um, uh, we are not seeing what Michigan, what Minnesota, what Pennsylvania, what Connecticut, those states are, they are going in the wrong direction. And we do not want to have that wild card, the variants, gain a toehold here so that we get knocked back away from the line that we're holding right now and the progress that we've made. So I'll, let me pick the ball up there a little bit just for the audience, uh, for municipal officials who may be interested in renewing a mask mandate in your city. We still have a sample ordinance. Uh, we'll probably need to tweak it a little bit in light of the governor's comments a couple of days ago. Uh, so watch for that on the, uh, on the website uh, within the next 24 hours or so. Uh, Mark, the other thing, just to build on, on Mr. Sure. Keith's comments, you know, businesses, I'm hearing on my board call this morning, others uh, uh, individually, you know, businesses value the community's ordinance because it gives them something that they can then, you know, build off of. Uh, if a business leader is out there on their own with no city ordinance, no leader at that local community level, again, amplifying the risk, at least in the near term, uh, then that business leader really does have a tough time with their publicly facing uh, businesses and the patrons because we all need to be unified in the common message that the lifting of the state mandates was not an all clear signal. The risk from COVID-19 today is just as high as it was a few days ago. 
as we get more people vaccinated, that risk will go down. And once we get to 50, 60, 70 percent of the state that has either been vaccinated or had COVID-19, that's when we'll be able to start relaxing our efforts. So, I've, you know, I feel like uh, I've been in a, a biology and chemistry class for the last year. Um, uh, because, uh, f frankly, I would never would have used epidemiologists and virologists uh, in my day-to-day -day conversation, but we do have a question in that regard. Uh, both those uh, sets of uh, scientists uh, believe that current uh, vaccines will only be good for a year uh, and maybe less due to the mutations. Do you think that's accurate at this point, or do we not have enough information to really know that? Well, we've talked about this. This is a new threat to humankind. We've never experienced it before. We can build off of the knowledge that our epidemiologists and our virologists have had with other diseases, other infectious agents. I am hopeful that these vaccines, particularly if we can get uptake high enough and knock the virus out of our communities broadly enough, that the vaccines may have lasting effects far beyond one year. Um, if we don't get vaccination uptake high enough. The threat is that the mutations, because the virus mutates and spreads to the next person, the mutations may outrun or outflank the protections that the vaccines give us. That's why I've said we're, we're in a race here, a race to get vaccines high enough before the tricky COVID-19 virus mutates fast enough uh, to escape the controls that we now have available to us. Uh, switch gears with me. Uh, pediatrician question. Sure. Uh, some studies now show that Pfizer is very effective uh, protecting adolescents against COVID. Uh, what do we know about this? Sure. How, how do you feel about sure. it? Uh, Pfizer has done studies uh, and, and reported results in children down to 12 years of age that show that their vaccine is both very safe and very effective at stimulating an immune response that provides protection uh, for adolescents aged 12 to 16. You'll remember it was already effective down to 16. There you have now done tests down below 12. That data has not been submitted to the Food and Drug Administration yet. I would anticipate potentially this month that it will be. I think the Food and Drug Administration will act quickly, but probably uh, with a little more deliberation because we are dealing with kids. Uh, uh, and, and that potentially as early as the 4th of July, for sure by the fall, we could have vaccinations available uh, for children down to age 12. There are also studies going on down for children as young as six months of age. Now those are more complicated studies. They're taking the adult dose of the vaccine and they're giving a quarter of it, a half of it, the full dose to younger age children because of both safety concerns and effectiveness questions but those tests are underway, and as that data becomes available, I think sometime next year, probably 2022, we will have vaccines available for the full age range of all of our children. But until then, it's the adults that we need to encourage to take the vaccines as quickly as possible, because once you're vaccinated, once we start to be able to break the potential of this virus to infect the next person, we start providing protection not only to the adults in our community, but also the kids that are not yet eligible to get a vaccine. So let's move into the discussion that we've periodically had about uh, conferences, large conventions, festivals, et cetera. Sure. You mentioned earlier, if we can get to that 60 to 70% range vaccinations and those who have had the the virus uh, that uh, you didn't say this but i think that gets us to a herd immunity at least a a discussion of that or getting close to it um so the, the questions are when do we think that's going to occur uh and uh, and or when do we think that it may be safe for us to go forward with those various events sure so again, I think this comes back to once you're vaccinated, those questions about your personal risk and your tolerance for that risk. I think it's still premature now uh, to be having large venues come together um, because you'll remember on the slide that I shared, we have about 15% of our Kansans adults that are fully vaccinated, maybe as much as 25% that have had one vaccine but not yet be fully vaccinated. Uh, so that's our mark. Uh, as we get more and more people vaccinated, I think we will see hospitalizations continue to decline, 
deaths start to decline. We are still having, as I mentioned, 10 to 15 deaths a day. Those are lost loved ones increasingly at younger ages, not the old, elderly, I should say, because they've now been vaccinated. It's the younger age population that has not been vaccinated for whom this virus is increasingly claiming lives. So I think we've got to get up to 50, 60, 70 percent. Uh, if we have good uptake, I think the supply lines are opening. I think we could be at that by the 4th of July. And, and so I want to encourage everyone to, to, to spread the information that the vaccines are safe and effective and increasingly available for all. Because if we can get to that higher level number, uh, then the second part of our summer could truly be like the ones we've enjoyed in the past. That'd be great. We really would. And, and there, we is a, there is a wild card. We're going to keep watching the variants, the variants. and that wild card. Right. But, but we are making progress now. And if we can continue, we have a promising uh, uh, summer in front of us. Yeah, fingers crossed that we can make that trip to St. Louis. That'd be great. Uh, it's sort of a twist on things. I don't want to have to read between the lines on part of this, I think. But uh, the question is, if... if uh, my spouse and I are fully vaccinated, but our children aren't. How does that come into play uh, when we're being around others without masks? So I think, I think it's obviously the parents are vaccinated, the children aren't. D does that, is there some extra precaution they ought to be taking when engaged with others? Sure. So we've got lots of different possible combinations here. So this is where we use the science that we know and we apply logic in the circumstance. Uh, children are not eligible for vaccines, so we're not going to have immunized children for a while, uh, and younger children in particular. So this is a real life issue that folks are gonna have to face. Ideally, all of the adults would be vaccinated. The children are not eligible to be vaccinated, and so your group if you will, is as safe as you can possibly be. Again, smaller groups, better than larger groups. Uh, I would still put off the larger family reunion until you can ensure that you know, all of the adults have had a chance and have availed themselves of vaccines. Um, but as you come together, uh, ideally the adults are vaccinated, the children are gonna be unvaccinated because they're not eligible. You need to still use logic and use those precautions. Frequent hand washing, you know, if you're adults seated, try to sit your relative disparate family units separately. Um, use good hand washing. Do it outside if you can. You know, use logic that we know how to fight this respiratory virus. We have a very specific uh, question uh, from uh, the clerk in North Rock, Diane Whitby, who always has a specific question for us. And this one is, what precautions should a person take if they have to travel to Michigan next month? So if you have to travel to Michigan next month, and I, I would revisit the have to at this point in time. I understand, you know, lots of things happen, but in the question, I would start with revisiting the have to travel to Michigan. Right. I would pay attention to data in Michigan. We didn't present the local data here, but to find out if the locale that you were traveling to is one of the true hotspots. You'll remember over the course of the past few months, this virus moved around our state. We had zip codes, we had communities where more than 1% of the residents were newly infected in the past seven to 14 days. So I would avail yourself of information from Michigan. And then if you have to go and you are going to a place uh, that has um, a significant amount of COVID-19, I would use every precaution that we've talked about to try to safeguard yourself. I would make sure that you are fully vaccinated before you go and that everyone that travels with you is vaccinated if they are eligible. And drive, don't fly. Drive if to. possible. Yeah. This is, this is think, it, think logically. If you can drive, drive. If you have to fly, direct flight. Uh, if you have to fly and do a, a pass through, when you're in that transition airport, get away from the big crowds. This is logic. Uh, you know, this is about self-protection, right. and, and we know enough now, a year later, to be able to put some of those things into effect each and every day that we are um, in this uh, uh, transition period out of the pandemic. Well, I think that is my last submitted question. So, 
Uh, as always, I want to thank the audience for joining us and the folks and friends at Waymac and crew. Thank you, Joe, you and your team. I, I, I continue to say it. you amaze me with the information that you're able to put out in, the, in such a timely manner. Uh, Mr. Keat, thank you so much for joining us. I, I think having that uh, contact with the business community between uh, municipal leaders uh, and local business leaders is a huge, huge plus for each one of your communities. I think you were going to say something. I'm, um, I'm going to make sure, Mark, that you and the chamber and, and others have our board's call to action for the local leadership. I hope it stimulates you to think about in, in the responsible ways and in the influence that you exert how you can continue to encourage, reinforce, even require uh, continued adherence for the next 60 to 90 days uh, for the CDC guidelines, which are still in effect. The only thing that's changed, the only thing that's changed are bars being allowed to stay open past midnight. All of the other recommendations are unchanged this week on April 1st and next week compared to where they have been over the past several weeks. The only thing that's changed is the penalty that the state government no longer places on you. That is a transfer of responsibility from the state to our local communities and local leaders. And I hope we all see the importance and candidly the responsibility that that represents. Thank you. Um, also on the call are our friends at uh, UCA, the uh, Community and Economic Development Group there, the Arkansas Economic Development Institute at UALR and A-State, Wolves Up, and members of LEAD Arkansas, thank you. Police chiefs, fire chiefs, thank you. All the municipal officials, all the chamber folks, uh, both local and state, thank you. A reminder that this call, this combination call, will be uh, Thursday, April the 15th. I had made that a tax day joke, but now it's been extended uh, into May. It doesn't, doesn't work as well. So. April 15th, the combo call at 11.30, our normal time. Uh, league folks, don't forget our three o'clock calls on Tuesday that are sort of a mixture of uh, current information, legislative and COVID uh, related matters. Uh, let's make sure everybody that you are checking your various information uh, sources. That's the ACHI site, the league's website, and specifically the uh, the COVID-19 resources page, our social media uh, pages. If you don't follow Akai and Dr. Thompson on Twitter, you should do that. It's very informative and we are frequently sharing each other's content. So it's a good way to cross over and get uh, additional information. Um, I want to uh, make sure that uh, we have the opportunity to continue to do this. I think uh, it's been very helpful. I, I think the combination calls have opened up an entirely new world for us, which I, I'm very appreciative of. It, it allows everybody to talk and, and determine uh, at a local level what sort of mask mandate would work and how to go about doing that. So I'm, I'm excited that we did that. Again, we'll have that ordinance uh, redone for you in some form or fashion over the next uh, 24 hours. Um, I want to, again, thank everybody uh, for being here, taking time out of your day to do this. There are always some folks out there that are, are suffering, uh, that are a little less fortunate, addiction issues, emotional health issues, and just frankly, people that are lonely and could use a reach out. So do that, please. Call those folks, send them a text, check on them. Uh, it, it can really make a difference in their lives. Uh, that the addiction part of this is near and dear to my heart. So please, there, there are plenty of people that are hurting. Let's make sure we give them the support they need to, to stay sober and not hurt themselves. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna uh, say as I always do, wear your mask, stay six feet away from each other, practice good hygiene, and uh, be safe and smart. Peace, everybody. <laughs>